Thirsty yet, anybody? I hope so, because it's Thirsty Thursdays. And we have a wonderful guest today who's going to teach us a lot about whiskey. So how about a big applause for Mike Breezebot? Nobody can hear me. Yeah, they can. Mike's on. You're on. Big hands for Mike Breezebot. Yeah. How you doing today, Mike? I'm good, Dan. How are you? Good. Anybody, everybody see what we look like right now? Anybody? I'm using a little bit of a new system here, and I've been kind of frustrated, but I think it's working out, right? You're not. I can only see you, Dan. You can only see me, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you'll see some other things. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Split screen there. Oh yeah, you're if you're watching it on another device, there's going to be a bit of a delay. That's all. Yeah. I will figure out the other part, and next time we do something, it'll be virtual, and you will see what we're looking at. Yes, you goofball. The whiskey scouts here talking about goofballs. Anyway, uh, Jason Fisk is saying hi to you. Hi. Hey, Jason, how are you? <laughs> and the French guy wants me to learn how to pronounce French a uh, French name. Tabernacles. <laughs> That's all I know how to say in French, especially to you, huh? Oh, Mike. Mike, how do I say your last name in French properly? Brisebois. Uh, Brisebois. Well, there's more letters in it than that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, Mike, you and I have some whiskeys here. so we, we do. We have a few. We can share. And why don't you, first of all... Explain to everybody who doesn't know who you are, who you are. All right. Well, honestly, Dan, thanks for having me. I know we've been talking about this for, it's got to be at least over a year, about getting together and uh, doing a live stream and talking about whiskey and enjoying a few drams. And uh, so who, anyone who I haven't met yet, uh, Mike Breesbaugh, I'm the brand ambassador for Distel Malts. And I get to represent three distilleries in Scotland, those being Bunnahaven from Isla, Deanston from the Highlands, and Tobermory from the Isla Mall. Um, so this month, it's been five years I'm brand ambassador, and honestly, I, I couldn't imagine being in any other job because uh, it's, uh, it's a dream job, honestly, getting to travel the country and getting to geek out with whiskey enthusiasts. And, uh, you know, uh, I think the best part of the job is really sharing a dram with, with those who enjoy whiskey as well, and we can just sit back, relax, and that's what I'm looking forward to tonight, Dan, is doing that same thing, enjoying some drams, talking about them, and uh, learning about these cool distilleries. That is, I agree. Um, I'm quite happy about it because I actually got to go to Tobermory. Yes, you did. Enjoyed, enjoyed it. It was beautiful. I could have stayed there for the rest of the trip, probably. Um, there was a rally car race on at the time, Mm -hmm. Um, so it was packed. That place was packed, right? So, oh, look at this. I think, I think your wife might get mad when she starts hearing comments like this. <laughs> and why is that? Whiskey heathen. Well, I don't know. I don't like it when Josh flirts with me. Mm. <laughs> um, okay. So I haven't poured a dram yet. I think I should. Yeah, I I have a few in front of me. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I got a Tomori 12 in front of me, and I got a, a Bunna 12 in front of me. Well, I always get in trouble with these guys on here because I never open up anything. So you say you have a Buna 12? I do. I can open one of those, but that's a little tiny sample bottle. How about a, <laughs> I'll open up a Tomori 12. Oh, nice. Right? Just because the... I'll tell you what, the guys at... The local liquor store out here, they said, you got to try this. This new Tobermory 12-year-old release is phenomenal, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I have to agree with them, right? Hey, Sipper Social Club, how are you doing? It's it's a fun whiskey, and I we launched this whiskey in Banff this uh, last September. So that was a fun one to have. Yeah, it is. It's, it is good. And you know what? I am going to, because he came in here, there's a buddy of mine, Santa Cruzan, from the U.S., from, from the States. 
I'm going to pour that into a sipper social club glass. Very nice. Although, oh, well, I have more than Tobomori. I have a nice Tobomori glass, and I'll tell you how I got that later. <laughs> Very floral. This is great. Yeah, and you know, Tomori 10, we discontinued it, um, what, two and a half years ago when we closed the distillery for renovations. And we re released the new whiskey, which is the Tomori 12. And the 10 and 12 completely different in flavor profile. You didn't get this much floral and those fruit notes uh, that came out of the Tomori 10, where the Tomori 12, it's just right there. Um, even at 12 years, 46.3%, it goes down so nicely. You won't see this right away, but I'm going to pull up a picture of Tobomori. Mm -hmm. You will see it in a, in a delayed seconds. That is, I, I don't think people can see the mouse, but the white building with Tobomori on the side is actually... A different story altogether. We'll talk about that at the end. I have a story to tell you. Um, the distillery is behind it. Can you see this yet, Mike? Not yet. No. Nope. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, we drove down the hill. That's the only hill you can see. And it was phenomenal when we got out of that, that little rock valley there. Yeah. And you got to see this place. And the the history just by looking at it. Yeah, it's it's crazy how there's so many small buildings around the distillery. And if you actually look, the building on the far right, uh, the multi level building, actually used to be our warehouse. And in the eighties, the owners at the time actually sold it off to make apartments. So at Tomore, we actually don't really have a warehouse. One of the distillery buildings was kind of changed over into a warehouse. Uh, so we have like. I don't know, 30, 40 casts in there. But all of the whiskey that we mature uh, for Tomori is at Deanston. Yes. Okay. So it's all at Deanston. It's all at Deanston. So we have, uh, what, 10% of these casts that are at Deanston are Tomori casts. Okay. So we'll understand that a little bit here because, oddly enough, there's only one little warehouse in this distillery. That's true. Right? Um, now, let me find the right photo here. There's a different one. This must have been much more summer. We were there in October. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm learning how to use this system here, guys. You'll have to hang in with me. This is way up, but looking behind away from the distillery. So it's very similar to an area in Newfoundland, but they have a really unique story about how they ended up painting all the houses different. Yeah. Do you know that story? Uh, so the story I know, it's uh, an artist that painted his house a uh, different color, and then everybody kind of just went with it as well. Oh, there it is. <sighs> Yeah, and it is it, it is gorgeous. You walk along them shops and, and and just walk in. There's pubs. People are friendly. It, it's it's an amazing place. And next time I go, I want to spend like three four weeks on Mall because you know it's the only one. It's the only distillery on Mall, but there's so much history there as well. Um, you can actually visit an old whiskey cave on the island where you, you know a lot of the illicit distilling were actually happening. On a lot of these uh, these in the Hebrides, right? So you look at Mull, that cave that was there, you can actually visit it. You can see where the steel was actually in place. You can see where, you know, it goes so deep where they had some of the barrels that were hidden. Um, and you wouldn't be able to see it from the water because it actually went over a bit of a hill and then into the cave. Um, so it was like almost like the perfect place to distill illicit whiskey. Oh, that would be awesome to be able to go there. Mm -hmm. That would be. So you got one comment here from our friend in Montreal. And I think that we'll let you read it briefly if you didn't see it, that you can, and you can address this later. But apparently you're not, uh, they're not getting any, anything, they can't find anything but virgin oak. So. 
And if I'm not uh, able to you'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we can talk about Deeston when we get further on. I know in uh, Quebec, we had Tomori 12. It was an online sale. It sold out pretty quick. And uh, we do have, I believe, Lechik 10 still there as well from this distillery. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Tobomori. I'm trying to find the other photo here. Is got this nice sign here. So, you want to explain that sign that says, please, quiet, please, whiskey sleeping. <laughs> yeah, so that. That's just right at one of the, where our mini warehouse is at the distillery. So it's kind of unique for us that we have that sign. So it's just, you know, pay respect to, you know, the whiskey sleeping and maturing and, you know, just sleeping its way and the angels in the warehouse itself. It's a quite small warehouse, as I mentioned before, 30, 40 casts. But there's four casts in there that are, are aged quite, uh, have been mature in there for quite some time. And it's there's two Lechik 1972s. And there's two Tobomori 1972s. Now, 1972 is, is a, a great year because that's when the distillery reopened after 40 years of being closed, uh, from 1932 to 1972. And in 1972, we changed the stills because they were just done and did a few renovations at the distillery. But it only stayed open for about three years. Now, you'll notice that there's very limited releases coming out of that distillery during that time because, again, it was opening and closing almost every second, third year. And being able to still have some whiskey from 1972 is, is quite a, a feature. So there's the watchbacks over there. Um, but when I was visiting the distillery, um, the distillery manager brought us into that small little warehouse. And we were looking at the four barrels of 1972 and we're like, hey, can we try it? Um, and not a hesitation at all. It's like, sure, no problem. So we tried the Tobermory 1972 and the Lechik 1972. And I can tell you, Lechik 1972... I've never, and I've, I've, I've been a whiskey geek for a long time, and I've tried, I've had the pleasure of trying some great whiskey and some aged peated expressions, but Lechik 1972, you know, 42, 43, 44 years of age, still has that essence of peat and smoke, and I never get that from an, a very aged whiskey. Like mostly peated expressions that uh, over 10 and you get to 18 year, you get that peat influence, but it's not there anymore. It's not like that, you know, that medicinal diesel seaweed. Yeah peat expressions that we look for but it was still there like that's it that's just phenomenal to me that, that sounds wonderful i loved it there uh we had a very interesting young fella that i think now is working at deanston's and we'll talk about that later because i have to find a video on the camera but he was uh yeah. he was a very generous host while we were in the warehouse yeah yeah well also tobermory has a huge connection to canada and we were talking about this earlier, Dan, but, um, and that's the reason we launched the Tobermory 12 in Canada in Banff, Alberta, uh, because Fort Calgary was named after the Hamlet of Calgary on Mull. And we wanted to like, you know, kind of pay a little bit of respect to the two countries together and launch it in an area where it's such historic, you know, history, such as Banff. And then Tobermory itself, uh, with being named, uh, with Calgary being named after, the, the small town of Calgary in Mole itself. But also, Tobermory, Ontario was named after Tobermory Mole. So it's probably one of the biggest connections to it, like a Scottish area in Canada to a distillery as well, uh, where Tobermory really comes. Well, that's awesome. It's always good to see the connection, right? So I quite enjoy that, right? Um, Peter, Peter uh, Takeda is asking me if the host was Graham. And if I remember right, it, it, Graham's a little fella, shorter, shorter little fella. Yeah, short, little big. He wasn't. No, this guy wasn't too chubby, but he was. Uh, he he did a good job because I think he had a wild party that night. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember your group going, and it was keg and cork, right? Or we're with the keg and cork. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I remember you guys. I found out you guys were going, so I wrote a little message to the distillery. And I think you guys got a little special treat when you were there. Well, yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I think it started with a 40, if I remember right. Yeah, I think it was electric 42. Yeah, it was. <laughs> both, both Dave and I, the rest of them, decided to wander around and do their own thing. 
<laughs> oh, that's amazing. And I'm like, yep. Yeah. When we were there, they were discussing about trying to remove the uh, roof and replace some of the, the washbacks as well as the uh, one or two of the stills. Yes. And that has been done since? Yes, it's done. It is done. And now they, they actually put a window in so you can actually see the stills from the outside, where before it was just a complete uh, stone wall. Uh -oh. I can't wait to go back and see it. Mm -hmm. yes. Same here. Yes, you should have, Josh. You should have gone. I uh, don't know if this Graham guy played the guitar. I'm being asked by Paul again if he played the guitar. <laughs> he was, uh, well, let's, I'll get to the photo here. This is the uh, kind of walking from the gate to the, uh, it's one of the photos you sent me. Walking from the gate to, uh, to the warehouse and yep. back to the, the shop, but you actually had to pass the shop. <laughs> And you went by this, which is, let me get rid of the screen here. This little little house on the side is, yes. is more like a frat house from what we saw. Oh, it, it feels like a frat house. <laughs> <laughs> the women we were with, there were two married women in our group of eight. They were like, why are we in here? <laughs> it was hilarious. Um had nothing to do with the whiskey. It's just they're, they're two married mothers that are retired. And they thought it was hilarious. Like, what are we doing inside this house? But I, I'd move in that house in a heartbeat. Yeah, I would too. Yeah. Yeah, there's the distillery. Swami, I'm not hiding your comments. I can barely keep up with the way they're coming in here. So I don't know what he said, but... I don't have time to post them all, right? Oh, here's one for you, Mike. You get to it. Mike, you need to force the SAQ to get more get more deserve in their product selection. I don't know what deserve means, but well, it's a hard battle from what I've seen for any rep to get stuff in there, right? Well, to, to be honest, you're absolutely right, uh, Malta to Montreal. Like, we want to get more products in Quebec. We want to get more products across the country. And we've only really seen a lot of limited editions from our brands really coming into Canada over the last, you know, two years. You know, you look at Bunna PX that came out, uh, it's got to be almost, yeah, two years ago. And then we have some limited editions coming out very soon. But it's it's been really rare that we got even Bunna 12 in Quebec at the SIQ. Like, you used to get small um, allocations, and now we're getting a little bit more. And... We've been pushing more 25-year Bunna in Quebec than any other province in the country. Because when I look at Bunna fans in Quebec, there's a massive amount of Bunna fans. And I can see that through a lot of the Facebook groups and clubs uh, that they're wanting it. And, you know, two years ago, Bunna 25 sold out in 15 minutes online at the SIQ. That's how much there was a demand for it. Um, but, yeah, we want to get more in. We want to see what we can do. You know, uh, Quebec and Alberta were the first to get the Chouet Air. Quebec and Alberta were the first to get the Tochiga uh, Bonahaven. So we, we really want to really see how we can spread them around the country. Absolutely. If I can get them in every single province and every city, I'd love it. Um, and then I can come visit more often as well. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. We're pushing a lot harder to get more expressions. And uh, we'll see it in the coming months and year, especially Deanston. Uh, we have the Virgin Oak at the SIQ, but uh, of course, I'd love to get the 12, the 18, uh, even some of the other limited editions that are coming in as well. Yeah. I, I don't think all of us, and myself as well, understand how difficult it is sometimes to spread out and get it to everybody that wants it. It's kind of a difficult Yeah, and battle. when you look at the three distilleries, like, well, I know we're on Tobamori now, but we don't get a lot to come to Canada. And like, we look at distillation. Tobamori was distilling 600,000 liters a year. And 20% of that goes to single malts. So there's not a lot of juice that's being spread around the country. Um, and that goes the same for Bunna. It goes the same thing for Deanston. Like, it's it's not like we're producing 10, 20 million liters like, you know, the big distilleries. We're, we're small. Um, could, between the three distilleries, we produce, I don't know, 7 million liters a year, which is... Not a lot. That's some good stuff. Is there anything yeah. else to know about Tobamori, or should we talk a little bit about Lachey? 
Um, yeah, we talked about uh, Lechik. So yeah, Tobomori, we produce two single malts. So we have Tobomori, which is unpeated, and then we have Lechik, which is our heavily peated expression. Okay, now I have... Where did I put it? The chig here that I'm going to pour. It is a uh, manzanella. Oh, are you doing the 21? The, is a man, manzanella 21? Yeah, I'll, I'll join you with that. All right. Let's, so, I knew you. I'll uh, wait until the system stops lagging so everyone can see the bottle on my screen. <laughs> and then I'm going to pour it into a Tobomori glass. These are really my favorite glasses. So while we were at the distillery, I said to the guy, I said, where can I get some of these? He's like, uh, uh, you have one in your hand, right? Just put it in your bag. <laughs> <laughs> like, Thank you very much. See you later. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so Lechik 21 is part of our limited editions that were for 2019. And they're finally going to get into Canada sooner or later. They're, they're at the LCBO. We had some released in BC, uh, the Palo Cortado Deanston, and we had the Bana French Brandy Cask. And the rest are being released at the LCBO. They were supposed to be an online pre-sale uh, about two and a half weeks ago, but everything kind of got put on hold. Um because of everything going on, unfortunately, in the world. And I'm hoping that we can do an online sale soon. Uh, because I've, you know, the worry is a lot of limited editions, they are priced a little bit higher. And especially with the economy and everything, is it at the right time to release? Yeah. And I'm getting messages from everybody saying, just release them. We want to buy them. Um, so that's what I'm telling the LCBO. That's what I'm telling my colleagues uh, as well to, to help, you know, get these out there because there's interest. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here from Nicole. Yep. Which is, are the Lechig um, barrels... No, I just lost the comment here. I saw it. So are the Lechig barrels kept at the distillery? Yes. So there's some There's some kept at the distillery. Um, so we have, I think, a little over 500 barrels of Lechig that are being matured at Deanston and 1,500 barrels that are being matured at Deanston of Tobamori. Uh, so... Of the 3040 that are at the distillery at Tobamori, I, I can't say it's 50 50, but there's some that are electric and there's some that are Tobamori. But again, the majority are actually aged at uh, at the distillery at Kingston. Okay. Mm -hmm. We had some beautiful stuff when I was there. Mm -hmm. No one's mentioned it yet. I thought for sure that a certain guy calling himself the Whiskey Heathen would look over my head and see something back there, but I didn't move enough. Well, an interesting story about this 21 year, Dan. We were in Banff, and I know Josh. Uh, yes, is this a is huge, an awesome story. Huge Lechik fan, and we launched Tobamori 12. But I also wanted to, you know, surprise Josh with something. So we went back to our hotel, actually my hotel room, mm -hmm. and there was 22 people, I think, in my room, and we we're just surrounded, and you're just having a great time. Everyone had a glass, and. I was able to get a bottle of Lechic 21, but it had no label on it. So it was just a white label written Lechic 21 Manzanilla because it didn't even get labeled yet. They sent it to me so that I can get Josh to crack it first and open it. And he was the first one to drink it in Canada. I didn't drink it first. I waited for him to crack it open and drink it. And, uh, you know, it's things like that that I love this job the most is that I want to spoil people if I can. And Josh being the Lechic fan that he is, uh, is a memory that we all got to see in that room of him, you know, holding that bottle for the first time. Well, we all lost a dear, a dear, dear friend which you knew, um, Jeremiah Wheelock, J, yeah. J, we all called him. And we had a little bit of a memorial for him the other day. Mm -hmm. And your name still came up because of that very event, because we were just talking about things and... And so that, that story is getting passed around even in the most solemn moments. Mm -hmm. It is legendary. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is extremely sweet. I'm uh, not extremely sweet, but it's sweet. Mm -hmm. It's the type of peat or smoke that I like, because I, I would consider this to be more smoky than tea. Yes, I agree. So all of our... Peated barley comes in Port Ella maltings. So a lot of people ask me, where do we get our peat? Where do we get our barley? So same thing with Bonnet. So anything peated comes from Port Ellen. 
And with the sister distillery, we source the same peat that goes to, for Lechik. Yes. Mm. Yep. And this is 21 year old. Isn't it? it is a 21. You and it's uh, cast strength 52.9%. Yes. You didn't write 21 year old on that bottle. No, no. No, my little sample there. What story? We're talking about his the the story of going to the whiskey explorer's room at the end of the Banff. I wasn't there, so one day I'll get to the Banff one. It's only during work, so yeah. Any comments I am missing? You'll have to translate that to yourself later. Or Actually, Dan, is what sample are you, are you drinking? The Lechik Manzanilla that I poured you a sample from my place. No. Okay, so you're still doing the limited editions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, that's the only other Lechik I had there, except for oh, okay. the bottle that I got to open up and share with uh, that little fella named John, Jay, or, uh, uh, what's your name again? Um, Josh. Yeah. Josh. Yeah. Yeah, Lechik is uh, honestly a lot of, there's been more of a, a following for Lechik expressions these days. And I, I've noticed it probably in the last year. Uh, a lot of, you know, peat heads are really jumping on Lechik. One, uh, I, I got to say the price point's great. And so you look at a 10-year Lechik for about $70 Canadian. But even the limited edition we got, we had a 13-year a month. A lot of those in the U.S., the 21-year uh Manzanilla, but we had the 19 PX that was here in Canada. They're all kind of this craven, like whiskey enthusiast palates, right? Like, I, I find that a lot of the expressions are testing the palates of whiskey geeks to something new and something different. I, I'm I'm impressed by it, and I'm not a peat head overall, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw uh, Jason Fix's question there. No, will Leche. 19px be seen again? No, that was a one-time release. Yeah, that that is a beauty, and I don't care really about who makes it. All whiskey is rare, mm -hmm. right? Especially limited editions, right? Yeah. Well, it, you see a lot of limited editions these days, and 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 not. I'm not going to talk about other stories, but when you look at Lechik 21 Manzanilla, I think there's 1,200 bottles available only worldwide. Yeah, and then you look at a lot of the other limited editions that are coming out, like for our distilleries. It, they're very limited. I think the biggest one was three thousand bottles, which was pop, one of the Deanstons. But um, yeah, it's it's a fun kind of style of expression of limited editions that we're releasing every year. I I got to see the new limited editions that are coming for two thousand twenty one, and we're all in for a nice treat too. Okay, here we are with the teasing again. <laughs> I just saw the pictures today. <laughs> Yeah? Yeah. Somebody thinks Sean Kincaid is here. He says, Mike should take us on a distillery tour. I'd love to. He would love to. We would <laughs> have him do it. Yes. Um, okay, 19px. I don't have that. I have... Oh, no, that's a different one right there. That's a Buna. I didn't really look at Lechegs. I've got two over there. An 18-year-old in the boxes. Yep. On my, I guess they're my left or my right. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a bottle. Do you want me to show you? Yeah, I can get a bottle. Oh, the bottle of that one? Yes, pull that bottle down. People like yeah. bottles. Yeah, I'll be right back. I got to go to the uh, bunker. To the bunker? What were you in? Anyway, everybody, I'm trying. I'm trying the best I can with this new system. So uh, hopefully, it's working well here, right? So I don't know when it'll show up on the screen, but that's the 19 PX. Oh, that is a nice looking bottle. I like that. I like that. Mm -hmm. It's not an overly flashy label. I like that. Yeah, this is. Uh, this was truly special. I so that hotel room in Banff, we poured the 21 Manzanilla unlabeled. And I brought something from my collection. It was a Lechik 20-year uh, that was bottled in the early 90s. So uh, we cracked that one open together as a group. I didn't leave any of the bottles, so uh, I think Josh had most of them. <laughs> but uh, wink, wink. But I believe 
I, I'm a true believer that whiskey is meant to be shared. And it is. Uh, so I get excited when I go to whiskey shows because I want to meet the whiskey enthusiasts and not just the show, but outside the show. Uh, do something outside that we get together. We just sit back and relax and chat and share our stories. Now, I've finished that one. Yep. And we've talked about to Tobomori and, and uh, the, um, Le Jade. What should we move on to? A Deanston or? Um, I'm going to move on to a little water. We had some peat and then. Um, yep. Yeah, I say let's go to Deanston and we'll, we'll finish off with Bunna. Okay. You sent me a beautiful photo of Deanston, by the way. That, that, uh, and because we're in Alberta and we haven't actually had a chance to have winter yet. I think if I get, oh no, that's a, for a question later. There it is. If I'm ever in Scotland in the summertime again, that's a beautiful scene, beautiful place. This is that summer photo you sent me. You'll see mm -hmm. the next bit. I, I'm all in Montreal. I can send you probably a sample because I don't have much left in my decent 12. That's, that's all I have left. <laughs> oh, I don't. I'm sorry, Salami. You only want the 12. I only have an 18. I, I'd send, you know. Or you could just stop griping about Alberta and move out here and have all the whiskey you want. Oh, there you go. There is, uh, Chris says that with, uh, Mike gave me my first Boone Haven 12 and a De Deanston 18. Yeah, I think I sent him a sample. <laughs> well, there you go. He'll be, he's very appreciative of that. Catherine bon Bono has not yet tried a Deanston. I think it is time that you try mm -hmm. one. Now, where is that photo? With well, Back to this. So this plaque says that the distillery, Deanston Distillery, opened in 1967. Yes. Okay. So give us a little bit of the Deanston. Yeah, so the actual buildings surrounding Deanston were actually built in 1785. And the it was actually a cotton mill in, in its first existence. And the village was built around it. A uh, hydroelectricity plant was built into the cotton mill to, you know, give electricity back to the village and the community. And over the years, you know, the demand for cotton really slowed down. And at one time, there was 1,500 people working at the cotton mill. And that's where that community kind of flourished and was really successful in, in, in you know, especially that economic time and industrial spirit of time. Mm -hmm. And in 1965, it closed and 66 started and changed over to a distillery and started distilling spirits in 67. Um, our first single malt was released in 1974. It was an eight-year uh, eight uh, single malt. And then it kind of flourished from there. Deanston is a, is a distillery where we like to take risks. We're entrepreneurial spirit. We're industrial minded. We want to like try different things and new things. And that's what I love about Deanston. It kind of tests your palate as well. And they do things that some distilleries don't do. Like you look at Deanston Virgin Oak, for instance, it's matured in next bourbon barrels and finished in Virgin Oak casks. And I call that a whiskey for someone who likes bourbon that never goes into Scotch whiskey. Give them a virgin oak, dirt deeds of virgin oak, because the sweetness that they get from that can steer them and understand what Scotch whiskey is about. Um, but like a lot of the limited editions we're releasing, a lot of these one-off bottles we're releasing are just experiments that are actually going well for us, uh, as we've seen over the last couple of years. But Deanston is the only uh, uh, distillery that's 100% self-sufficient. So we produce our own electricity. So we have our own hydro electricity plant that was built during the cotton mill era. And we only use about 20% of the electricity and the rest goes back to the community. And Deanston's biggest thing is spirit of community. We like to give back to the community. And especially during these hard times, uh, Deanston and the cafe that's at the distillery are making soup every day to give to the children and those in need around the community. And they deliver it to them every single day. So it's um, just giving back to the community is a huge, huge thing. And that's what we want to keep on doing, especially during hard times and every day at the distillery itself. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of that in, in Scotland and areas where they're, mm -hmm. the, um, 
the, they really give to the community a lot. Yeah, and absolutely. That's a really good example that it means to this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know we only source our barley from local farmers, so it's something you don't hear of often. Uh, most distilleries you want to get as much barley as you can anywhere possible, especially when you're distilling millions and millions of liters every year. But for us, we source only from Scotland and from local farmers so that, you know, again, give it back to the community, give it back to the farmers surrounding the area. It, it, it is in a beautiful area. The building actually reminds me of a place I grew up. Uh, they were also for cotton, and that's in the Maritimes, actually. Mm-hmm. So, let's we'll see, you'll catch up on these pictures, but they're your summer pictures you sent me. Now mm-hmm. we're looking here at the stills in Deanston. Oh yeah, the stills. So if you ever visit Deanston, it's probably one of the most beautiful distilleries you'll ever see. Um, so you're seeing probably the multi-level floor. So Deanston is the only distillery that has multi-level floors. So that being the old cotton mill there. Uh, two of the first floors were taken out so the stills can go in. And the top two floors are vacant. So you can actually, if you're lucky, you can visit them. And you can see where a lot of the old machinery is actually in place. Um, but what I was mentioning about the stills and how beautiful things are, Deanston is probably has the most shiniest stills anywhere of any distillery that I've been to. And they, they, you know, everyone who works there really cares about, you know, the area and the environment and want to ensure that when people visit, they see the beauty of the distillery. Uh, we're one of seven distilleries that has an open mash tun. So we have an 11 ton open mash tun at the distillery. So when you visit, you can actually see a mash tun in full operation, where most times when you visit a distillery, it's a closed mash tun. You see it through a little peeping hole. Uh, but at Deanston, you see that you know, the whole experience. But the one thing I love most about Deanston is our warehouse. I know. Our warehouse I just is put up the old wheat shed. Oh, yeah. It is. I didn't see it there. I'm, and I'm, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you, but that it, no. the roof in there, and, and, and is it in the basement? Like, tell us. The it is. It is. So it's, it's, it was built in 1836 and it was actually built so that it can, you know, the fluctuating temperatures would not split the cotton. And that's where our barrels sleep and rest until they're ready to be bottled. Um, it's fluctuation of temperatures are nil. The fluctuation of humidity is nil. So it's for us the best place to mature whiskey. It's the only warehouse of its kind probably in the world where you can see the vaulted ceilings. At one time, there was about six feet of soil above it as well. The soil has been removed, but uh, you can really feel the history when you walk through there. Um, if any of you have ever been to a warehouse at a distillery, that you know that angel share just hits you right in the face when you walk in, and you get that right there. Uh, but just surrounded by so much history. Yeah, I'm going. The next, my next trip. Hopefully, if things settle down in this world, would be on a motor. Mm-hmm. Oh, that'd be fun. All the way up through there, that would be. To me, it would be anyway. Yeah, it's uh, it's fun. And, you know, it's not tough to get to. If you either fly into Glasgow or Edinburgh, it's about 40-minute drive to the distillery. Yeah, it would be, uh, I think, I, I would like it very much. I think it's, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so what, Dean, what was I drinking from Deanston? Yeah, what are you going with Deanston? I, I think we were doing our palate cleansing thing, right? Yeah, I was doing a little bit of water just to... But uh, I got a few. I don't know what you have at home. I have some of these bottles. I don't know if you can see them yet, but I have them. I have, for Deanston, I have the 18-year-old. I have the Virgin Oak. Yep. Um, I have a Palo Cortato. I have an organic um, Oloroso. We got some nice ones. I have a Deanston Brandy Cabernet finish. Oh, you have a Deanston Brandy? Yes. I don't know if mine's open. It better be. <laughs> this one's not, but my other one is. Yes. I think that's what I'd like to pull, actually. Okay, I'm going to grab my other bottle. I'll be right back. All right, guys. <laughs> Any questions that might answer my question? Like, oh, the 14 organic is pure dunnage. Oh, yes, in, the, in their warehouse. Actually, it was, it's still sealed, but I'm going to crack her anyways. You're a good man. Donner Press, how you doing, everybody? Thank you for coming in. 
Yeah, I agree. That 14-year organic is pure dunnage. Like, you really get it in the bottle. I have a bottle here. So next time you're in Ottawa, Dan, you can uh, give it a try. Right. Oh, you can hear them. Guys that give me these nice samples like this, like, you don't know how. Uh... So this brandy finish is actually the limit edition following the Bordeaux matured. So this one is a 2008 distilled. Uh, I believe it's a nine-year cash rank whiskey. So you get more – like the Bordeaux was fun because it was deep fruit. It was heavy. But the brandy is more light, more lighter fruit notes. I but the honey the, really comes out as well. The Bordeaux because I never got one. So, Oh, my heavenly Lord. This is – wow. I love that note. Wow. Mm. Yeah, it's a – I, uh, Jason, I drank one of the brandies already. So it's <laughs> oh, I, I might have missed that comment, Swami. Sorry. Mike, do you rep any rums? So I am a brand ambassador for th the only th three distilleries to distill that are in Scotland. So there's no rum in my portfolio. Rum. So there you go. I have some run finished whiskey. That's probably the closest I can get to rum. That's a beauty. It is. I cannot. So I can sit with this now. I already know right off the nose and just sit there and nose it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you want it. It's one of those ones that I would nose for a long time because as soon as I taste it, I'm gonna. it's going to change on my palate or on my nose. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to add one, two, three, four, five drops. That's all I do. And I'm going to let it sit. Because this mm -hmm. one is beautiful. I like this. And it's only nine years old? Wow. Nine year. 75 rounds. I'm adding a little bit of water too. So. Yeah. It's only yeah, this one's bottled at 56.4%. Uh, it didn't seem to be too hot. I just mm -hmm. want to get more out of it. Mm-hmm. It is. Well. Hmm. Oh, yeah. The good Deanston, that is. Yeah, this one was released at the LCBO, but they didn't even showcase what stores had them. It was almost like they were hiding them. That's good when they're hiding them, right? I think. Well, we're trying to push for a lot more online sales. Um, so then we can either pre-sale or online sale just to, you know, that everybody gets a chance to do it. We know that a lot of the big cities get them here in Ontario. But I know a lot of whiskey clubs around, you know, you look at Kingston, you look at Brockville, you look at some of these smaller cities around Toronto. They don't get any bottles, but they have a huge community of whiskey enthusiasts. So... We're trying to push more for online, just to you know get it in the hands of those who really want to appreciate and drink it. Um, somebody asked if your uh, if the brandy was still available. No, it's not. Uh, that one, it's probably October now that it's been sold out. Yeah, doesn't mean it's not available on some shelf somewhere. You just gotta hunt, but yeah. That's the only way I find some things now, right? Yeah, a lot of times you'll find LCBO, like a lot of people don't know Deanston. So it's, uh, you may hop into an LCBO and look at their whiskey shelf and see a Deanston brandy sitting there. And Wow, this is, this is good. Mm -hmm. Andy Cass finish. That's, that's good stuff. You betcha. Yeah. So we've talked about... Everything but Buna Haven so far, correct? That's right. So I'm trying to think of anything we missed with Deanston. Yeah. We did it pretty quick. Um, I'm going to look behind me here to remind myself. Well, I actually have not had... Other guys have out here found enough. I just, was like you said, I wasn't looking for it, right? Yeah, we had a good amount in Alberta of Deanston. We had Deanston 20 Oloroso. We had... Uh, we had decent 18s that were there for a good while. 
I have Dean Sweet Dean in the Virgin Oak. Yeah. But I'm a fan of Virgin Oak almost with everybody overall. You know, just. Yeah. Because you have too much division between Sherry fans and, and Peated fans, right? Where it, it gets a little redonkulous that people get a little out of hand. Mm-hmm. So I prefer, you know, I want I want to see what that whiskey's like. Yeah. Without being manipulated by other ingredients, so to speak, right? You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. So all of our distilleries are natural color, ungeal filtered, mm-hmm. and bottled at forty six point three percent or cash strength, which we lower than forty six point three percent. That's usually with our older age expressions. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. But uh, the only other thing with Deanston, so we distill about three and a half million liters a year, and twenty percent goes to single malts. And of the blends, one is Scottish Leader, which is our um, our blend for the Asian market, and Black Bottle. But there's a huge demand for Deanston New Make for blenders because it has a bit of a waxy note, a little bit of honey note as well. Oh. And that's due to our fermentation process. So our fermentation process is about 100 hours, which is uncommon because usually about 40 to 60. But we want to keep that going to get that waxy honey note because that's what that flavor profile that Dean's is really known about. And that's what we keep going for. Oh. So you can send me uh, some that you make then. I'd like to try that. You did try it. When I was at your place? Oh, okay. Did I? Right. Well, I think you might have to give it to me at the end. Uh, it may have been midpoint. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, I always have to throw throw the controversial uh, questions at you. Otherwise, I'm not being <laughs> Mike, would you say that Deanston's biggest competitor is Glen Ella? I, um, I never got a sense of competition I, I, over in Scotland, period, actually, in my opinion. I would say for like, for them, they're risk takers as well, and they're they're experimenting and having fun. And I think there's some similarities with the two distilleries, but in terms of competition, I don't know. Like I, I just find they're quite similar in terms of taking risks, uh, per se. Um, the, in Scotland, it's not competition; it's more, you know, what differs from one distillery to the other. Um, what I like about Deanston and what I like about the other two distilleries is just test your palate. Uh, amongst all in terms of flavor profiles as a whole. He says that he f- asked that question because he finds that they share similarities, right? Yeah, I agree, 100%. And I think the word to use is is um, a cooperation, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, yes, they compete against each other, but they're not really out to get the other guy to be better or worse than the other guy or whatever, right? No, 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 and I see it as a compliment as well because I see the two being quite similar in terms of how they're doing things. Sure. Now I, uh, now I need to learn how to make this system work better. <laughs> um, I had these working right beside each other. Now I can't get them to join. There we are. Duh. So Nicole just asked a question about more blends coming from Distel. So I am just got off a call last week about getting our South African whiskeys back into market. And I did mention Alberta for three ships and Baines. So getting a little more of our South African kind of whiskeys into market again. Will I notice anything difference between the bottle that I bought that was sent to Canada versus the Baines bottle that was bought as a gift from South Africa? Should be exactly the same. They should be. Uh, So everything in South Africa for whiskey has to be 43% by law. So the benefit we get in Canada is that it comes at 43% as well. So it's the same bottle, same juice. Same juice, right. But the only one I, I would like to get is the uh, same company. Is it not Three Ships? Yeah, Distel owns uh, Three Ships and Baines. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Donner Press, wondering if there is a ton of older Deanson 12 tan box in the U.S. It's really hard to find the newer bottling Mm-hmm. white tub tube yeah i don't know for the u.s um i know we started getting the new bottles in canada just recently um but uh Turlato wines is the um 
agency responsible for distel in the U.S. So maybe if there's a rep out there, uh, I know a few of them. I can reach out and get back through Dan and let you know. Donner Whiskey. Donner Pass Whiskey. Well, uh, mm -hmm. you can find the Whiskey Explorer on Instagram. And probably DM him a private message, up there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Because I may forget. <laughs> yeah, so if any questions at all about the whiskeys in the U.S. or Canada, you can uh, direct message me on Instagram at the Whiskey Explorer. No E in whiskey. Sure. Um, okay. What are you, you finishing up your Deanston there? Yeah, I am. I am. Did we miss anything with Deanston? No, I think we got. Uh, I think we got the gist of it. I think, I, uh, I'm very fond of this brandy. I'm glad I, I actually uh, waited until you were here to try it. <laughs> the Bunna? No, the Deanston Brandy Cask. Oh, nice. Did, did I give you a sample or did you have a fresh bottle? No, this is a sample. There was no, none available out here that I never saw any anyway. Yeah, none went to Alberta. Well, uh, thank you very much, Swami. You uh, say hi to the wife and... Uh, Take care. He says that we did a good job answering my questions, Mike. So. Perfect. Thanks, Wally. Um, so, Bunna, I, I, I always like starting with Bunna 12. Okay, I can handle that. I think I can handle opening up a bottle. Oh, you had to open it up, too? I have to open up this little bottle because I do not have a Buna 12, a small Buna 12. Oh, I might outside, but whatever. You... Good thing I sent you a sample on that uh, limited edition kit. Yeah, and this is a second sample. I used the one you sent me. This is a, I don't know if a local rep attached this to something. Okay. There were some different ones, but I, I just, yeah, I'm taking it. <laughs> there we go. I don't care. I'm taking it. We'll start with this, and then we're going to get somewhere else, and we're going to have a little bit of fun with something that will upset people because they're going to ask can I get it and, and you were <laughs> haunting me with the fact that you cannot get it. I've become to be known for that a little bit. Well I have a few of those too but not quite as elegant as the one that you mm -hmm. were very generous with. Mm -hmm. This is the So my story as a brand ambassador actually starts with Bunna 12 and that's why I like starting with it because I like telling the story about really how I got to be a brand ambassador for these distilleries. I love that story, actually. And uh, so I used to have a whiskey club here in Ottawa. And, you know, a good group of us get together once a month or every second month. And, you know, buy a few bottles. You, you pitch in $20 each and we built a club stock. And I started getting really good at calling on uh, reps and agencies to get bottles sent to me. And I got a bottle of about a 12 cent. And I looked at the bottle and I'm like, I have no idea what this is. Like, and there's a sailor on the front. It's a black bottle. It's Isla. It's probably heavily peated, which at that time I wasn't really into peat. I started, but wasn't really a fan. And when I took my first sip, I was blown away. The explosion of flavors, the deep fruits, the nutty notes, the vanilla, the, just a touch of salt and, and a whiff of smoke, it, it blew me away. I need to know more about the distillery because I knew nothing about Bana. Um, so I reached out to PMA Canada and to the distillery and I wanted to meet the brand ambassador because part of my club, I was meeting, you know, I had Dan Volway here. He was from the Callahan Park. I had Frank Biscupic from Glen Livick in my house. And I'm like, I want to meet the brand ambassador because I want to pick their brain. I want to know everything about the distillery. And over the phone, they're like, well, we do have a brand ambassador. We have our global brand ambassador, Dr. Kirsty. And she comes to Canada, you know, maybe once every two years, but she picks either the West Coast, East Coast, or say Central. Um, and I said, well, we need to get people to know about this whiskey because it's amazing. So I think you should hire me to be the brand ambassador. So they said, okay. Uh, so five years, three months ago, I had my first taste of Bonnehaven 12 year. And five years this month, I'm the brand ambassador for this distillery. So it's um, a dream job because I'm very passionate about this whiskey. I get to talk about it every chance I possibly can. And uh, I love raising a glass. So Dan, I'm raising this glass to you, Dan. 
for having me on and talking about whiskey because uh, I'm raised, if it wasn't for this whiskey, I'm raised I wouldn't be on you because truthfully, it's nice to meet someone that does their job because they're passionate about it, not just because they're trying to make a paycheck. And I really appreciate that about you mm -hmm. and your generosity. And uh, I'm going to tell you something. This is a good whiskey. It is... Mm -hmm. uh, It's, it, it is more complex than somebody might give it credit for, actually. Yeah. You know, you got to be, you got to spend more time with this than you would, well, quite a few other ones. Yeah. I agree, anyway. Yeah, she's a beauty. And this is my go to whiskey. And anybody will ask me, like, I get, I have the privilege of tasting a lot of amazing expressions from these distilleries. And when I come down to, my basement, like if I showed you the other side of this camera here, it's all kids' toys and everything, but there's one corner over there that's my whiskey cabinet, and this whiskey is one I long for. So if I know if I'm looking to try something and I'm looking just having a whiskey one evening, and I'll pour myself a dram and just enjoy it yeah. 45 minutes to an hour. I agree, because I can take that and enjoy it just as much in the Copita or a Glen Karen as mm -hmm. I can in, in, a, in a tumbler, you know? I can pour that in a tumbler and still appreciate it and enjoy it as much because I know you get to know it that well, one. Yeah. And sometimes not being asked questions either by other people or or by yourself, um, whether it's your whiskey or your food or, or something else you're passionate about and just being able to not analyze it and enjoy it is a privilege mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. it is so i i can really appreciate why you wanted and went up to the person and said hey you should hire me to be your ambassador mm -hmm. yeah i i don't think that would ever happen again but uh i I'd feel very lucky and that's why you know like when we were in edmonton when my first ship to edmonton you were there when we did uh the tasting at uh the bothy the bothy, yes. I don't want you to have to pay to come and see me if I'm organizing a tasting. I want you to enjoy it. I want you to sit back, relax. That was have a good classy time. touch. <laughs> I remember because I said, yeah. And it was because Josh of Know Your Whiskey on Instagram brought my name. And I'm like, yeah, I would love to come. But how much? And you're like, no charge. It's, it's It was great. And you had a bag to give us all out. Yeah. So forth. It was very, very professionally done. And mm -hmm. that's the first thing I remember now that you brought that up, and I'm glad you did, because this is where you got to know the whiskey geek that you are, mm -hmm. and that you talked about why you got into this and why you like Buna having so much and all the other ones that you talk about. Mm -hmm. Not just because you're getting a paycheck; it's because this is the reasons I like whiskey. Yeah. And now, when I was at your place, I saw all your books, and I still have two that you lent me here. Yes. I think I've forgotten. Uh, one is about beer in Canada. Yes. And the other one, people don't realize this, they talk, and, and, and uh, there's a couple people on here that probably will want to try to get these books, but... Uh, this is the first book, I think you told me, that was actually written about Canadian whiskey. Mm -hmm. Before the one that we're all hearing about now, right? So, here it's it says limited. Thank you for the efforts in making 1998 a success. So, this is, I, I think this is a phenomenal thing to know in the little history that it has. Mm -hmm. But you have quite a collection of books, don't you, on whiskey? Yes, and... When I first had my my first taste of whiskey, I what was it? How old am I now? It's got to be almost 15 years ago now. I before I drank a whiskey, I wanted to learn more about it, and you know, I bought books and I started reading on it, and I got fascinated with the history behind it. So I didn't just stick in Scotland; I stuck in Canada too, because there's so many stills in Canada. If you look at Upper Canada, every farmer had a still because they didn't want the grain to go to waste. Yeah, and I just bought more and more books to just read them. So some of my books are worth more than some of the bottles of whiskey I have because of the history behind them and when they're written. So I should take care of these two? I, I trust you. 
<laughs> okay. They're right next to a few other ones. They're not as good as these two. Some of them, well, actually, I'm very fond of a couple, but this, the, the other ones, I got them because they have recipes on how to make bacon with, nice. with the whiskey. <laughs> Primarily bourbon, but they're there. Yeah. Um, this is a phenomenal whiskey. I'm going to, but you know what? I like, I like stuff that's a little uh, less pretentious, I think. Mm -hmm. This is good. Now. But I think. Well, go ahead. Thinking is good. Go ahead. Tell me. Tell me what you think. I've been thinking a lot over the last couple of weeks because you know I'm not traveling anymore. Oh my lord! I, I forgot. I, I think we need to go back to the basics sometimes and and look back at the history of how you know, Scotch whiskey has evolved because you know we do a lot of tastings. We we educate ourselves on distilleries, but we forget about the history behind it. Like going back to the 1400s when there was so much illicit distilling, and I think. I have a plan. I, I'm trying to incorporate some of this into some of the virtual tastings just to get back to that history, like key milestones of the Scotch whiskey industry and even Canadian whiskey industry uh, and, and look back on it and get that message out there. Because I think there's a lot of people interested in knowing how it really evolved back in the 14s, 15s, 1600s. I, yeah, no, really. I mean, it helps us understand, mm -hmm. right, why we would yeah. appreciate something to know the origin of it right yeah um it does it's very helpful i appreciate your approach that way yeah um this picture here we're gonna show everybody is what you would see if you were first arriving at bunahaban i would assume that would be a beautiful scene coming down that road and i mean the roads in uh, scotland they're a little they can get a little narrow especially in the countryside Compared to when yep. you get closer to a metropolis, and it's neat yep. to see a, a over the fence is somebody's boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think of it, the first eighty years that Bunahaven was distilling whiskey, yep. the only way to get there was by boat. Wow. There was no road at that time. And when I went down that same road, my first trip, I had goosebumps because I felt like I was going back in time. Yeah, like you've seen those old original warehouses, the distillery buildings. It was, you know, it was breathtaking, honestly. I, breathtaking. I can appreciate that because I think I had a few of those moments when I was driving through Scotland. It was very nice that we had a, a tour guide. Um, not the perfect setting because not everybody was able to sit in the front seat. Somebody might have got travel sickness. There's certain things about being able to travel. Yeah. Um, but it... It is. You get to see things, and it gives you a different thought about stuff, especially if you're trying to look behind, in, in, like in history, and think, how did people live on this area, right? Yeah, it's true. This true. here is a, is it's a it's an awesome scene, right? Very picturesque. Yeah. Yes, that is a good spot. I like this. This is now a close up of what we saw earlier of the actual pier. Now, is that pier part of the distillery, or is it kind of a community thing for the whole area? So that's part of the distillery. It used to be part of the area before when the village was actually still, you know, people are still living in the village. But the pier uh, was meant because the ships would actually come in to unload the barley, and they would actually shovel it by hand to wheelbarrows to bring it in. Because we actually had a kiln at the distillery that we stopped using in 1963. So we had our own malting floors, our own kiln. And the malting floors are still there today. So if by chance we wanted to start malting our own barley again, we could. Um, it's, a, it's a possibility. I know there's no talks of it now, but there's a chance and a possibility that we could. But in 1963, that's when everything kind of changed at the distillery. From 1883 to 1963, all the whiskey that was distilled at Bonnehaven was for uh, blenders and was for a heavily peated expression. But in 63, everything changed. We doubled our stills and we started sourcing our water from a natural spring. So at the distillery, Bunahaven is the only distillery on Isla that the water is 100% clear. So you're able to offer something on Isla that no other distillery can. And that's why our core range is unpeated. Our 12, 18, and 25 year are unpeated. So but you're getting an expression that's truly unique. The water source is, for, is clear. Clear, 100% clear water from now, Margadale Springs. Yes, it's coming from the springs, so it's been filtered through the the natural stone and so on of the of yeah. the, that 
I, I, I would love to see that, actually. Yeah, yeah so that, that's the other thing about the distillery in the area. You could grab a little, you know, 200 mil sample from the where, from the shop, and then you go up north, and there's hidden waterfalls up north of the distillery. It's honestly picturesque and, and such a beautiful spot to see. Yeah, I, I can see. Yeah, I would. I don't know why Nicole asked or who she's asking. What's in the background? But uh, is she talking about the phone of the photos, or is she talking about uh, behind us? I don't know. But she has to be more direct. There's bottles of whiskey behind both. Sure. <laughs> so this is the, what we would walk through when we were first starting to get in. I assume. Yeah. The Buna Haban Distillery. It's a, a arched stone gate. Yes. Now, our first 12 year was released in 1979, and it's completely different to what it is today because in 79, it was chill filtered, it was added caramel and bottled at 40% alcohol. Now, this one here is 46.3%. It's a combination of bourbon, wood, and uh, ex sherry cats. Okay. So you, that's where I get that explosion of flavors that really come out. It is. It is uh, you could spend quite a bit of time with this for. for uh... Yes. A regular distillery release, I think you could quite easily. Yeah, this one just won best whiskey aged up to 12 years for the San Francisco Whiskey Awards. Just recently, last three days, I believe. Okay. Now, is there anything special in their actual process? In the whiskey making process at Bana? At Bana, yep. So the unique factor is uh, we have two fermentation cycles at the distillery. So one runs about 60 hours, the other one about 100 hours, and they marry them together because we don't operate on the weekends. So we let them just Everybody ferment over the road. Off? They get the weekends off. We don't distill on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So it's a double fermentation process, which makes it unique and different. But the other cool thing, there's our mash tun. That thing's massive. Yeah, it's, it's massive. Tons. And then I've got the wash. Uh, the washbacks? Washbacks there beside, after that photo now. Yeah, so that's a 12-ton mash tun. Uh, that thing is enormous. When I was there at the distillery, Andrew Brown was telling me, you know, when things break down in the distillery in, in one year on Isla, you can't call someone in to, to fix it. So the mash tun actually broke down. And Andrew Brown, the distillery manager, and the warehouse man, the stillman, went in and took shifts to shovel out the barley wow. so that they can get it operation again. Because, you know, you get 12 tons of barley in a mash ton, but it's also like 100 and, what, 105 degrees Fahrenheit in there. Yeah. it's uh, So they're taking, like, five-minute runs, shoveling out, jumping out, one jump in, five minutes, shoveling out, put it in, fix it, put the barley back in. So, you know, you it's you have to be resourceful when you're there, so it's it's quite amazing when you hear those stories when you're at the distillery. You think everything's perfect, right? We get this amazing bottle of whiskey at the end of the day, but there's things that happen in the distillery that they take risks and yeah, want to ensure. That I I, I, uh, I can fully fully respect that actually because mm -hmm. of the work I do. People may yes, it, but I can fully respect that. Yeah, right. I can. But uh, it's, a, it's a cool distillery. Uh, our stills are the tallest stills in Isla. Okay. Uh, but we only use 50% capacity. So we have, like, our wash stills are 35,000 liter capacity. We only charge them at about 15,500 liters. Um, so you're really getting more of that. You're getting a lighter spirit, but you're getting that essence of flavor that really come out from those stills. I, a gentleman known as Welsh Toro just joined us. Oh, hello. He is in Spain. Oh, very nice. He says it sounds romantic. He can't, his streaming is not working the best. But I, Welsh Toro and I are always in the chats. We're both known as WT. <laughs> right? So, but there, I have a picture of the washbacks up. Now, is there a reason they only use them at 50% capacity? I, I mean, the stills? Because you want to get that flavor profile that Bun is known for. That's really what it is. It's, it's strictly that you, yeah. Well, that's good stuff. That's. People don't realize it, especially what the story you just told about um, getting the the guys getting in there and getting dirty to get it to work. Now, yeah. I, I am not 100% sure this photo, this next photo I put up that you sent is, it's it's in the, 
What it's titled at is, is Final Crop. Uh, see. I see the stills right now. Yeah, it'll change in a second, right? Um, it is, uh, I'm sure it's in a mash tun. And it's being loaded up and it's being stirred. Final. That's actually Deanston. That's Deanston? I didn't. Yeah, that's the open mash tun at Deanston. Okay, so it's an open yeah. mash tun. Now, what makes that different at Deanston? So, so Deanston, you don't have the cover. Where at Bunna, we have it covered, closed off. But does it make any difference being covered or not covered? I don't think so. Um, they're rare to see. It's uh, I don't know if there's a real difference, but I can find out. I can call uh, Stephen Woodcock tomorrow, a master distiller, and see if there is a difference between the two. That's the first question I ever uh, Well, I think that asked. I, I'm just curious because with a cover on it, you would get condensation, and it would be yeah. dripped back inside. I'm just curious if there would be anything that would make a difference. Yeah. Yeah, when I was at Deanston, I saw it in full operation. We went through three waters when I was there. Yeah. Wow. Honestly, amazing to see. Yeah. Nicole has a question. Taller than Ardenhoe? I would believe they are, yes. And Welsh Terrell says, I do like my Boonahaven. Well, yes. Is there anything I've forgotten to ask about Boonahaven? Um... Trying to think here. Or you forgot to tell We're going through a major renovation right now. Right. So 11 million pound renovation. So we updated the visitor center. Uh, we actually had to tear down two of the warehouses. My last trip when I was there, the roof of one of the warehouses was collapsing. So the warehouse men were pulling out barrels left, right, and center. I've never seen barrels move so fast in my life. And they had to tear down two of the warehouses closest to the water and reset them back and build two new ones. Um, they're also renovating uh, three or four of the village homes. They actually eventually stay at the distillery yeah. and actually, you know, experience the whole surroundings. That would be wicked. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but go ahead. It, it's it's a journey to get there. Honestly, like you can just go take the ferry into Port Ellen and visit six distilleries in a day, and you know, get your fill of it. But I'll tell you what, the journey is worth it to go to Bunahami. It is breathtaking and if you don't go eventually you regret not going because the scenery and the experience there is second to none i have a question for you then yeah would you learn how to ride a motorcycle and and do a motorcycle tour with me there i would but would the wife and children let you <laughs> well I, I still have my motorcycle like uh, book that i was going to take my test <laughs> oh thank you buddy it would be awesome that would be yeah. something else there. Uh, yeah. Somebody asked, you know, now we have a smarty pants in here. He knows quite a bit. His name is uh, Travis Watts. I know Travis well. Great guy. Yeah. And he's asking, fermentation times at Buna is what he Yes. Said. Yeah, so Travis, I know you're a fermentation geek, so I know you'll love this. Um, but no, we do two fermentation processes. So we have one, because during the week we are full operation, so we do a 60-hour fermentation process. But we're closed on the weekends. So we have a 100-hour fermentation process because of the weekend closures. And then we marry them together uh, before uh, putting them in gas after distillation. There you go. There's a very clear. Now I have another comment back to there, which is actually a Deanston photo. But yeah. from the Whiskey Scout. Now he's down in Kansas. Okay. And he drives, a, he drives a motorbike. But, you know, he doesn't wear a helmet. So, you know, he's kind of special. Uh, but his question was, or a comment really was, uncovered can allow foreign yeast and bacteria to infiltrate at times. But it, it, that may be true, but I don't think it's it, it's not a very long process once they get mm -hmm. stolen and stuff. Yeah. Like how long would it stay in there before it gets transferred? It's not long. Not long. No. No, I don't think so at all. Uh, but I was actually supposed to be at Deanston in July and I was going to do the whole, I was going to work there for a week. I was going to do my own uh, mash, my own distillation, my own filling, work in the warehouse, work overnight shift, do the whole experience. That would, but, uh, they allow that? Like that, is that part of working for the company or you just arranged it? I asked for it. Yeah. I want, I want, I, I need it. I have to like geek out and do that stuff. Oh man. I think that would be, awesome. it really helps you understand the entire process. It'd be, be 
future. Exactly. And, you know, I can read so many books, you can watch so many videos, but if I can get my hands dirty and actually get in there and, you know, I don't want to work the day shift. Like if you're working overnight, I want to work overnight with you. I want to share these stories about, you know, everyone working there. So when I meet all of you across the country, I can share the stories of the actual people that make this whiskey. Yeah, no, that's that's part of it. People don't understand that, right? All whiskey mm -hmm. is rare. And part of its rareness is the people. So if somebody comes along and they in, input something into a distillery and then they leave or they pass on, like a lot of the, most of the people, that's they've been there forever. Yeah. When they pass on, things change. Mm -hmm. Right? They may try to keep it as, as, as close as possible, but things change. Yep, absolutely true. Uh, absolutely we have a true. question here. Is Buna Haben 12, and you pronounce that word, uh, T-O-T-E-C-H? -tech, T -tech. Toy, toy Chikaga. Toy Chikaga, whatever, roughly around uh, same price in Alberta. I don't know, man. I think the Toy Chikaga is slightly a bit more. Okay, I would not yeah. have a clue. I'm glad you're here yeah. because I wouldn't know. Yeah, no. we got... Bunna 12 that just landed in Alberta. We had some Toy Chica that just landed in Alberta. We had some 25 that just landed. Um, so, getting some more. <laughs> now, I was pleasantly surprised when I was in Ottawa. I was in Ontario at the end of the year working. Mm -hmm. And somebody, very generously, first of all, invited me to their house, which and they'd never met me before. Mm -hmm. And then they said, here, I have some stuff for you to try. And you guys can see on the screen now what it's called. Buna American Craft Ale. And uh, I'll give them a better view there, Dan. You give them a... There you go. Now, it's got a person's name on the side of it. Lee McDonald. Is that right? What I just saw? Uh, Lee McDurid. McDurid. Now, you poured me a taste of this and my lovely girlfriend, Julia. Yes. And I'm telling you, I, I mean, you poured me several other things, too. And I was uh, totally impressed by this. Mm -hmm. I'll pour some, too. Yeah. Now, this is, we, we can't buy this. No. So this was bottled in 2018. 2018. Yes. And uh, we have a comment in here that it was clear... No, it looks clear for sure. It's very clear, yeah. Now, what makes it a... You explain what this is here. This is... I'm gonna... So this is just finished in American craft ale cask. Uh, so you really get those craft ale influences on the nose. This bottle was actually gifted to me, Dan. I didn't tell you this last time. We were, uh, a buddy of mine, I don't know if you probably know him on Instagram, Whiskey Pirates. He's a good friend of mine, Loic. Huge Bunna fan. Uh, and... I, I, I don't usually get a lot of gifts, so he came over to my place, and he's like, Mike, here's this bottle. I want you to have it. So he just gave it to me, and um, I'm pretty lucky, but it's a, it's a, it's a cool whiskey. It's, yeah. it's really about that experimental. You know, you see a lot of, you know, ale-finished whiskeys these days. This was the limited edition. It was only, I don't know how many bottles were released. It's very rare. It doesn't say anything on it, but you, usually these ones are three, 400 bottle releases. Yeah, I don't, you don't have anything other than what it is written on the bottle for me, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm looking at hand-filled exclusive, 50.5% cash strength, American Craft Ale cask. And that's it. It doesn't tell you which, like, which American Craft Ale or anything. No, no. No, like, for instance, when they first released uh, a wine cask at Deanston, so I was there, and I filled my own. That was their first experiment. It was this one here. It's a Deanston uh, seven-year distillery exclusive. And then all of a sudden, three years later, they released the Bordeaux. Ah. And one's a seven-year and one's a eight-year. And then you probably see the colors. They're pretty bang on the same. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. But yeah, this one... You know, Bun is cool because, you know, I was talking about rum. If we thought it was a representative for rum as well. We had a Bun uh rum cast finish as well. So we ordered a bunch of bourbon casts. And all of a sudden on the shipment, there was two rum casts on it. And 
they were like, oh, what do we do with this? So we started experimenting with it. So we released one, and it was phenomenal. It was a heavily peated rum finish. And um, I poured it at a, I brought it as a special bottle for a tasting in uh, Quebec, in a tasting in Quebec. And they were like, come buy it, come buy it. I said, no, you can't. It's a once in a lifetime try. But it's cool where, you know, we experiment with different types of casts because it's it's fun. It is. And so it makes it more interesting these days. And you can't expect to get a lot of it all the time or reproduce it all the time. This is the beautiful thing about anything we make, especially by hand, mm -hmm. is that we shouldn't necessarily be trying to reproduce it. Yeah. It's it's almost like it's it's to enjoy it at that moment. This is one of those ones. I mean, I don't, I will not be heartbroken that I took a bottle of it, but mm -hmm. it is. I don't know. There's something simple about it. It's but yeah. rich. You know, it's not complicated. Well, it's it's most likely a first fill ex bourbon and then finished in a craft ale. I don't have any information on it, but that's just my assumption. What's the ABV? 50.5%. 50.5. Doesn't, it's not hard on the nose. Mm -hmm. This is a, that's a delightful. I'm so glad you shared this with me, I swear. And then, and mm -hmm. I mean, it's a great gift from your friend. I mean, I left you a couple of gifts too. But you did. You can blend the two of those right down the toilet. Well, one yeah. of them. I don't. I, one of them for sure. <laughs> I won't even mention his name, but it has nothing to do, and and nobody would ever have gotten it. I bought it at the LCBO in Ontario, and it was. Well, somebody said it seemed to be kind of popular, but that just goes yeah. to show it wasn't. It was terrible. It's not good. It's there. It's there because I didn't want to pay for the extra weight on the plane. I think you were just trying to see if I actually, what I actually thought of it. I, I didn't want to be rude, but I said I didn't like it. <laughs> and I, 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 mean, I think the other one I left was half decent. But, uh, they, yeah, but I, that one's good. That one's good. Neither one of them compares to this. So. Yeah, it's a beauty. I'm glad that your friend shared this with you. And it was, but it was a distillery only available at the distillery. That's right. So there was a question about, like, can we get any of these spirits shipped to Alberta? I believe we do. I believe if you wanted to buy some bottles directly from the distillery, they'll ship to Alberta. Yeah, you can. Um, uh, Josh does that. Yes. But he makes sure it goes through customs. So he gets a phone yes. call from customs, and customs calls him, and he pays the duty or the tax, mm -hmm. and they ship it to him. It's not a big deal. Yeah. You just, they, I mean, you're going to pay a lot more in the yeah. long run, but I mean, then you're going to find out how much things cost, right? So, mm -hmm. and I have a, uh, I have one thing here that I'll show you. I don't need to open it now because I think I've had enough already. I got a work mm -hmm. point that I brought from the story that you cannot get anywhere. Let's see if we can get this to work. If Josh is around still, he hasn't said anything in the comments, but this is Leche, 16-year-old American Oak. Ooh. And it was distillery only. I uh, And I think it's a pretty damn nice whiskey. Fortunately, they had a sample there for me to try first. But... And we will have to share that. Ooh, with uh, with some, and then and then this one here we had as well, which is 2004. We were drink. I was drinking this right out of the cask. <laughs> Amazing. With with the thief. So when we first went into the distillery, the guy doing the tour that came out of that house at Tobomori. I. In, in the conference room they had where they were talking to us was a, a board done up with different tool afraid of distilling. Yeah. But it was missing the a piece. There was some stuff missing. One was the hammer for hammering in the bung. Mm -hmm. And the other one was the um, uh, the thief. 
Apparently, he had taken the thief because they, someone had stolen the original one, the one they were using. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of funny that we had to we had to use a stolen a thief because the other one was stolen. <laughs> but yeah, and we had a great trip there on the Idle Mall. Mm-hmm. Um, part of it was. Two of us decided we wouldn't want to. We didn't need to leave so early and travel all the way back to the uh, um, the hotel so quick. But it was actually a forty-five minute drive, so we were literally on the other side of the island. Yeah. And so we asked the barmaid if she could ask a, a car for hire how much it would cost, and it was forty pounds. So me and Dave were like, "No problem. That's twenty pounds each. Big deal." Yeah. Well, we get in the vehicle, and the guy we're driving is is telling us some nice stories, and he takes us all the way up a different route, and he actually shows us the lake for the that is actually the water source for Tobomori. We yeah. get to see an eagle. We get to see a stag. It was it was great. And then he pulls in front of this gate of this house. We've been driving for about a half hour. And I'm like, where are you pulling in here for? He said, well, this is where you're staying. And I'm like, no, it's not. (laughs) And he looks at the map and finally looks up the name I gave him. And he goes, oh, I'm an idiot. And you guys are stupid for not going with your friends. (laughs) Now I have to drive back 20 minutes to get on a different road. We had to drive through these cows that were fighting with each other. Wow. And he finally got us to the Tororan house, which was where we were staying. Um, it was, uh, it was, but it was great. We got to see things that we wouldn't have seen if we hadn't gone on this adventure with this. Yeah. Guy, right. It was, I will go back there in a heartbeat. A matter of fact, I would tell anybody to take the exact same route we did when we were there. Yeah. Right. I would. No, it sounded like an amazing experience. It is. Oh man. I could, like you said, I could stay just in Tobomori right there the whole time. Yeah. I'd go and work at the distillery for free. Mm -hmm. Likewise. Yeah, I would. But I don't have a Tobomori camping cup like that one. No. (laughs) That is quite nice. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. I'm glad we did. Finally, glad. I really am glad we got together because I was holding on to this. This. Oh. I don't know why it is so much that I like this, but it's a special one. It's a special one. But uh, honestly, I I thank you too, Dan. Honestly, we've been talking about this probably over a year now to do this, and yep. uh, I know I do a couple Instagram live stuff these days. But uh, it's great to jump on with you and you know hear stories about you, hear you know your details of your trip and your memories, and you know resharing some of my stories and memories as well. Well, you've inspired me to go and, and uh, dig up all my photos and videos I made and start to compile some stuff. So, there we go. And, and to get back to uh, Scotland once we're out of this chaotic uh, self-isolation process we're going through right now. No, absolutely. So uh, absolutely. we've used up a lot of your time already. Okay. And, <laughs> but uh, uh, you probably need to, to get some rest. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to wake up to three kids at 6 a.m. Oh. <laughs> I wouldn't change it for the world, though. No, they're nice-looking kids, I'll tell you. Mm-hmm. They're fun. Lots of fun. Yep. But, so, uh, I, yeah, and thank you again for having me. Honestly, we'll do this again. We'll, uh, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, everyone who joined in to watch, thanks for joining in. Thanks for your questions. If you have more questions, you know, reach out to me uh, on Instagram at the Whiskey Explorer. More than happy to help out any way possible if you look for a bottle or anything. Yeah, that, that is very, and he is very helpful, guys. And so we really appreciate you offering that to us. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming in. Jason Fiss says, cheers, Mike. Um, I hope everybody has a good night and stay out of trouble. Behave and be healthy. We really want to get through this tough period of time in our history and we have lots of good friends that we can share whiskey with and and talk about things maybe not so serious and not watch the news all the time so let's thank mike very much for spending his time and educating us a bit about the fine whiskeys 
And everybody have a good night. Good night, everyone.